to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham. We're coming at you today nearly live from Toronto, Ontario. We're here at the Big Burks Conference. And I, apparently I've been saying it wrong all week. I've been calling it the Berkshire, whereas other people have just called it the Berkshire. No, the Berk, the, it, Berksh- Okay, the Berkshire. Berkshire, yeah. Yes, so right. So I've been saying it wrong. Which is how New England, how New Englanders <laughs> say the mountain range west of Boston, because that's what it refers to. Okay. It refers to this small uh-huh. mountain range about two hours west of Boston, where a lot of women's colleges are and were. And that was the hub of the very beginning of the Burks. Okay. So there we go. It, a history lesson right yeah. off the top. That is the voice of Cynthia Enlow, who is here from Clark University. We was at her panel yesterday, which was one of the best panels that I've ever been at, at conferences. And that seemed to be the, uh, the overall impression in the room, is that everyone really enjoyed it. There was a lot of energy in the room, and it was about, uh, or the title of the panel was Gender and Contemporary Economic Crises, and uh, Cynthia was a member of that panel. Like I said, here from Clark University, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here, Sean. I'm thrilled to have you here. This is really exciting for me. I think this is the first time in the history of the show that we've had somebody who's been referred to as a living legend. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> it makes me sound as though I'm a mummy. <laughs> well, I'll just run through. I did some research on... Uh, oh. I, if I did all of your acclaims and all that, we'd be here forever. But uh, 13 books, uh, one, of the, one of the ones that was referred to a lot in the research I did was Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, Making Feminist Sense of International Politics, two honorary doctorates, University of London School of Oriental and African Studies, also one from Connecticut College, amongst many awards, the Susan B. Northcutt Award, the Susan Strange Award, and a new book, which is just off the press from the University of California Press, the book is Seriously, Investigating Crashes and Crises as If Women Mattered, which is a great title for Thank a book. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll start with that. Uh, the, the basis of yesterday was looking at these crises and notions of uh, masculinity uh, and how they're affecting these things and how, the, the, and how a women's voice or a feminist approach could help address some of these economic issues that are going on in the world and continue to go on even though the crash was 2008. By no means is the system fully recovered. But in this sense from this book, like, why don't women matter? Why is it predominantly male voices in these debates? Well, I'm very interested in who's taken seriously. And that's why I decided about the, the title is Seriously! Exclamation mark, yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> As in seriously. Um, because I began hearing people, and myself, using, um, well that person's a really serious commentator or that person is really a serious historian or that person is really, you have to take that person seriously when they talk about economics or they talk about war or they talk about foreign policy or social policy. And so I began listening for it. And what happens for me a lot is I tend to start thinking about what might become a book, kind of mulling it over because I give a lot of talks on a lot of different campuses around the world and um, and I'm always interested in listening to audiences, students, mm. faculty, people from the community. And I, so once you have that idea in your head, you begin listening to how people use serious and seriously. And I realize that, that it is kind of a reward that's bestowed mm. on certain people. And those people are people who you have to take seriously because what they say matters. And matters means... It has consequences. So if you, you would never do this, Sean, but if somebody out there thinks that what women say about the banking crash of 2008 is just a human, just, that's just means it's not serious, okay. is just a human interest, and humans are not as serious as, you know, growth rates, and just a human interest story well, first of all, you put it one place in the paper and not in another. It's a filler. Right. But if somebody who is talking about the banking crash is taken seriously because they have expertise about what the banks did or didn't do, I listen for the gendering of seriously. And what I began noticing is 
it's not that all guys, every place, are taken seriously. Of mm-hmm. course, they're not. But those people who are taken seriously, particularly about wars, militarism, foreign policy, and economics, tend to be men. They tend to be men from dominant groups. And whatever they say is called expertise. What a feminist says, if she's ever, ever, ever interviewed about the banking crash, Mm -hmm. and there's some very good feminist economists, first of all, it's not taken seriously because it's just either it's human interest or this is even worse it's a special interest <laughs> right so when the when the the white male economist speaks on CNN or CBC or Sky Television mm-hmm. they aren't speaking for all white men and they're taken they allegedly mm-hmm. they're taken seriously because they are speaking for everybody right so they you take them seriously when Heidi Hartman, who's a very great expert on um, economics, when she speaks about the banking crash, that's, quote, just, okay, so that takes mm-hmm. away seriousness, speaking about women. Mm. Is this the result of, in at least the West, and I'll define the West as Britain, Canada, and the United States, just for the purpose of this question, yeah. that the people who represent us uh, at the highest levels, uh, with a couple minor exceptions. Uh, well, I guess uh, Thatcher isn't a minor exception. In Canada, we have a brief exception with Kim Campbell, but that it's men who are representing the country in political office. And is that translated then into areas of expertise where we're just used to having... It may even work the other way, Sean. Oh, okay. I mean, now that you say it, listen mm-hmm. to me just, you know, okay. calling out loud with you and everybody yeah. who's listening. Um, and that is, it may be because dominant group men mm-hmm. are the ones who are treated as experts that that gives mm-hmm. a great advantage for some man who looks like them mm-hmm. when they run for office and claim that they can fix the economy right i mean this would be true in here in ontario right this very week perhaps mm. yeah i haven't <laughs> paid too close attention to the campaign and how it's going but um, so well, it's, certainly, it's something to, to watch yeah and right? certain, given certain, it's two women who are yeah. running the you know two different parties yep. and the third is a white man yeah. right and he's he, his platform is pretty much entirely on economics yeah a, a narrow definition of yeah. economics yes. i mean that's the other thing about seriously when you when we say economics what are we talking about because one of the things that i thought was so interesting in yesterday's session by the way out of five of us three were canadian that yeah. really reshaped even if the room was a minority Canadian audience, so there were a lot of Canadians in the room. The fact that three out of the five people speaking about feminist analysis of the economic crash of 08 were Canadians really shaped the the discussion. So one of the experts, right, um, was a woman um, from who's a specialist on women in low-paid um, temporary. Uh, migrant jobs, yes. um, who works on women in the fast food industry. Mm-hmm. Well, she's an expert, but how often does, her name's Ethel, how often does she get interviewed on what is the economic crisis or what is the job crisis? Mm-hmm. Is she, or is she treated as somebody, oh, she's just, watch out for just, mm-hmm. or she's only, always put only in neon. Um, she's just interested in uh, Filipina or Latina you know, fast food workers. Well, she isn't. She's interested in the whole market economy and job market. And it's almost like, it's weird because if if people say that the media is liberal, whatever that means, then, but the way that we treat economics tends to be more sort of conservative in that it's just about the economics of it and that the actual human element, so what Ethel does when she talks about the actual impact of, the foreign workers program and what the suspension of that actually means at a human level, then that seems to get reduced for some reason, well, even though it's just I, as significant. Well, it's as if human is narrower than economic. Now, right. that is really bizarre, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't the, make right? sense. Uh, amongst humankind, not amongst all animals on the planet, but mm-hmm. amongst humankind, human is as big a category as you can get mm-hmm. and as deep a category as you can get. So the idea that economic as a adjective 
is considered bigger, more serious than human is really a bizarre notion. And it happens not only for people who are media professionals, it happens to us who listen to it. Mm. Um, so I think one of the problems is that most people who are trained in economics have a very narrow, sh I'd say shrunken notion of what is economics. And that is a serious, serious <laughs> problem. I, I, I guess the... the Counter to that would sure. be that if the market crashes, as it did in 2008, mm. that affects more people than, these, say, these foreign workers who are now out of work. And, and as Ethel was saying, a lot of them have nowhere to go now, and they're sort of stuck in these positions. That this is a group of people that's however many of them, and that's who it affects, whereas the market arguably affects more people. And maybe that's the counter to it, but that doesn't seem to... No, it's good to put it that way because, yeah. I mean, one ha the only way to make these sorts of points, to persuade people genuinely, not mm -hmm. just to win a debating contest, yeah. is to actually think of what is the kind of conventional, widespread, amongst lots of people, way of thinking about it. So one of the other po people on the session yesterday that made it such an energetic session was a woman named Karen Ho. Mm -hmm. And Karen is um, an Asian-American anthropologist, ethnographer of bankers. Mm -hmm. So she turned around and said, well, actually you have to look at the human interactions in banks, in investment banks during the bubble to understand the causes. So a lot of economists would simply watch the bad investments, right? The selling and the packaging of faulty mortgages or these things called derivatives that a lot of bankers didn't even understand and therefore they were unwilling to measure their own risk taking. Mm -hmm. And she went and looked and said, well, okay, Ethel is looking at the consequences of this really corrupted, I would say, not legally, well, maybe, but <laughs> corrupted kind of economic decision making. Karen said, I'm looking at the banking atmosphere inside on the floor of the trading houses and seeing what are the causes, and the causes were human. Mm -hmm. The causes weren't numbers. The causes were this notion of who's the smartest guy. Right. And, and how do you get to be a smartest guy amongst other smart guys? Mm -hmm. And it turns out her findings, um, which are very carefully done by close observation, is you get to be the rank the status of a smartest guy if you take the highest risks. Mm. And that's what created the bubble. Mm. So on the consequences side, you expand economics so it includes the human qualities of economics, but also on the causes side, which is even more radical, mm. you ask what are the human causes that create bubbles. Bubbles are not created by soap, right? right. Bubbles are created by mistaken notions of what counts as serious. And, and one of the things you've done in that same context, is you, you studied uh, the, I, the situation in Iceland. Right. And how that situation played out. And you noted that there was a similar situation there, and there was this wedding of masculinity and risk and nationalism. And how all these things played together to create a, uh, an economic system that clearly, or an, ex an economic structure that wasn't sustainable and clearly was part of the collapse there. And I I'm wondering how the connection between, how do you get that connection from risk to masculinity? And is it fair to situate it as yeah. a masculine thing or part of masculinity? Because I sit there and I hear masculinity and I think, well, I go and curl on Thursday nights. Yeah. And I take the least amount of risks when I'm, like, calling the game. Right. Like, I, I play so conservatively because I don't want to give up a big score, right? So, so is it I'm not masculine or is it that I'm not buying into that version of masculinity within the setting of banking? That's exactly – your second point is exactly right. There are more and more of us now um, who are doing feminist analysis use masculinities in the plural and femininities in the plural – so it's not just, are you, when you, I'd have to come and watch you curl. I'd have to see the whole curling set up, right? This would be great. Maybe it'll be my next thing, right? I'll do a feminist analysis of curling. Um, 
of your curling yeah. community, <laughs> right? But it's not just that there is one cookie cutter. In fact, one of the things about masculinity, and you see this in militaries, I'm, I, you know, I'm, that's where I really, if you will, cut my teeth on feminist analysis, is to look at lots of different militaries around the world and to look within militaries at different branches. So if you listen to Air Force people, they talk really differently about the infantry, right? Uh-huh. right? And, and what there is a tendency to do um, is to rank masculinities, that is, for men within a particular institution. This, I'm sure it happens within the RCMP as well. What, amongst the men and women mm-hmm. in the RCMP, what's considered the most guyo kind of job in the RCMP? What, amongst those guys who have that kind of job, mm-hmm. what do they consider the kind of, they might even use girl jokes, the least masculine of all the things you can be in the RCMP. A dispatcher? I mean, I'm not sure. It'd be right. really interesting to know. Because, so within curling, mm-hmm. and, but within banking, there is this ranking, and what and it happens over time, which is why it's so great to talk about this at the Burks amongst hundreds of feminist historians. Because in the discussion yesterday, several of the, you know, I'm a lowly political scientist, <laughs> right? So, But luckily, most of the people in the room were historians, and they said, now watch it, watch it. You can watch the idea about banking in any particular country, watch it over decades. Mm -hmm. What happened to the stodgy banker? Because the stodgy banker was really the very conservative banker. The banker who carried on investments the way you curl, right? (laughs) Right? Which is you lower the risk to to raise the profit. So... Those stodgy bankers, say, of the 1920s, it weren't that they were angels by any means, but they had a notion of maximizing their wealth Mm -hmm. and the wealth of their banks, and it was about conservative, very conservative lending. Mm -hmm. Out of that came redlining, which means you didn't even give a a loan to an unmarried woman or to a married woman of childbearing age. And Mm -hmm. in the United States... Until the 1970s, it was legal for American loan officers to ask a woman sitting across the desk who was coming in for a loan whether, in fact, she still menstruated. Wow. Honestly. Wow. Because they were trying, they, this whole, you can imagine the storyline. You, dear woman, um, seem to be a reasonable person, Mm -hmm. but there's a good chance that you're still going to have children. And if you have children, you're not going to be a good loan risk. Because once you have children, you won't be as active in the workforce, and therefore we might not get our loan repaid. Right. And only because of a change in American legislation introduced by a Republican woman in Congress, interesting enough, Margaret Heckler, was that made illegal. Otherwise, banks would still do it. So that's the conservative, stodgy banking. Mm -hmm. So what you now had by the 1990s because of the lack of regulation in the United States on banking, that is, it was done away with, was you had a new masculinity kind of gaining dominance. And that was the high-risk kind of of masculinized investment. It's really interesting to watch it over time. Yeah. But, but again, like, why? Because I, I, I think one of the things that occasionally men, and especially men my age, when they hear feminists, Anything. Yeah. The word feminist yeah. followed by whatever yeah. sort of sort of recoil or turn their turn off yeah. on is then when you say that it's a masculine thing, why is it masculine as opposed to a cultural thing just within this industry? Like like why does it have to be then tied to masculinity and it fe- and it can feel like at times that's placed on the entire gender, which yes. I realize isn't what is actually happening. But I could see how people would hear this or read this and say, well, I mean, I'm not a banker. I don't do any of this. Why is masculinity being tied up into it as opposed to a uh, a culture within these institutions? I think that cultures within institutions are gendered. Okay. Right? So, for instance, if you took the nursing profession, Mm -hmm. my guess for a guy coming into nursing, and while guys are increasingly coming into nursing, they're still usually a minority numerically. They find that there is a feminized way to weave 
care Mm -hmm. in a kind of maternal or at least sisterly caring way into the profession of providing medical care, right? Right. And and the guy would have to think, oh, wow, you know, that's not usually how I relate to other people, but it seems to be part of the profession of success or successful professional nursing. Well, within banking, it's about masculinization. It's mm-hmm. not just are you a guy or not, uh-huh. all right? And that's why it's different than sex because sex is about kind of the anatomy, although mm-hmm. we're learning new things about sure. that, but still. But um, but masculinities, plural, mm-hmm. is how you construct what it means to be a guy. Okay. And so what it means to be a guy as a curler mm-hmm. might be really play it safe. That's how we've learned over the decades how mm-hmm. to optimize your score and beat the other team. So right. You're still out to win. Mm-hmm. Where And in old, in 1920s and 30s banking, or say particularly 20s banking, maybe... I'm very, very ahistorical here, but maybe it was a kind of more pinstriped, stodgy kind of banking. Still patriarchal, still sexist, still racist. Mm. In fact, even more racist. But, but had a different idea about what it, the meaning of being a guy was vis-a-vis high risk. Mm. So you're right. One shouldn't be saying sweepingly. Men. One should be saying masculinity. When you say masculinity, you're talking culture. You're talking who says that that's the proper meaning of what it means to be a man in that industry. Okay, so because one of the things I found really interesting was a story that Karen told mm. where it was a high level uh, banker, I think, in the Vice Deutsche President. Bank. Yeah. Deutsche Bank. And her experience was that the men called her babe. Oh, wait, yes. No, it was another so, bank. It was Citibank. Citibank, yeah. The men called her babe even though they knew that they shouldn't and socially they sh- wouldn't be allowed to. But within this setting, this masculine setting, it was okay because everything was determined by profits. And that's, in fact, that's why reward systems really matter as to who's taken seriously. So inside of almost all the investment houses, and it hasn't changed much, there are laws against sexual harassment. Right? Mm-hmm. They're both federal laws, but they're also company laws. Yeah. So every one of those guys who were calling, and she was African-American as well, mm-hmm. um, calling her by a diminutive sexist term, mm-hmm. were violating their own company's rules. But they knew they could get away with it because the structure of rewards said, when it comes to bonuses, the only thing that matters, the only thing that matters is how much you maximize profit for the bank. Mm-hmm. And so that is structure. That is the rules of reward. And it's fact why it's so important. For instance, in the U.S. military now, there is a, properly a scandal around the rates of sexual assault by American military men on American military women. Mm-hmm. And it's now broken into the news. There are congressional hearings and so on. And one of the things that the feminist reformers want is they want a new structure of rewards for promotions for military officers. They want on that form, you know, forms for evaluation matter, Mm -hmm. what's on the form and what's not. They want on the form, has this officer effectively um, addressed um, uh, sexual assault in his ranks or her Mm -hmm. ranks? And they want the reward system to change because they think if the reward system change, all those officers who have been shrugging off every woman who comes and says, you have to do something about this guy who is, you know, assaulting women, um, he can't shrug it off because it doesn't matter to his promotion. You want it to matter to his reward system. Hmm. Now, one of the things that you, you mentioned uh, since we've been talking, and you mentioned yesterday, was regulation. And how the difference in the United States and Canada was that the United States deregulated its banking industry to a much greater extent than Canada deregulated its banking industry. And I think this came up in the question and answer period. And the the question of whether or not then the banking industry in Canada was seen as a less masculine industry because it accepted regulation. I'm curious as to how that would work Again, just trying to think, 
from like, just yeah out from outside yeah looking in it just looks like the obviously in retrospect that just having regulations just makes sense it's just a logical thing to do and and yet somehow it would get turned into this masculinized or even to to a certain extent if in a masculine culture in the United States that they would see the Canadian industry being regulated as feminized and i'm just wondering like like how we get to that point. So here's what you have to do. Okay, uh-huh. this is great. This yeah. is exactly this is the kind of stuff that makes you want to be an investigator, right? Right? Yeah. right? Yeah. A media investigator, a scholarly invest an investigator. Mm-hmm. So you think, okay, so how could I track this down? And one of the things is to really listen to Canadian men in banking. Mm-hmm. Um, listen to women too because they construct masculinities um, and ask them do they think that having federal banking regulation has made Canadian banking smarter. Use smarter, right? Okay. <laughs> um, not just more effective, smarter. Mm-hmm. And if they say, oh, yeah, those cowboys to the south, I mean, really, what kind of guys do they think they are? They're completely irregulated, um, non-regulated. Look at how irresponsible they became. We are responsible Bankers, and that's that can be the masculine. It doesn't have to be, but that can be the masculinization of responsible. Mm-hmm. So we we're the adults up here in the north, mm-hmm. right? right? We understand that there are consequences that you put limits on any kind of industry for the sake of common well-being, and we accepted that because we are smarter bankers, full of more common sense than the yahoos to the south, right? Yeah, yeah. So that would be Canadian, otherwise very maybe pet, patriarchal, maybe even quite sexist, but as far as their own self-esteem as manly male bankers, mm-hmm. they don't feel threatened. Right. Or, or, okay, you're still doing your investigation, yeah, yeah. or you interview a whole range of bankers at a banker's meeting. And maybe it would especially be interesting to do it at the ABA, the American Banking Association. Huge, huge, huge. U.S. dominated, of course, but a lot of Canadian bankers go, mm-hmm. right, um, for continental business. Sure. Or you find in your interviews that a lot of Canadian guys will say kind of, you know, off in the corner, say, oh, boy, it's really hard being here, you know. These guys down here, and they don't have any regulation. It makes us feel like wimps up in the north. I mean, we're so, we've got, you know, one hand tied behind us back. How can we be the smart bankers we are compared to these guys down here? Because we've got the feds up here. We've got Ottawa, you know, saying that we've got limitations on us. We can't be the really kind of high-risk, adventurous bankers that we'd like to be. Mm-hmm. So the question with being taken seriously or even being seen as who's manly who's not is to ask who does the observing so if you're a canadian male banker now you're a sexist banker so it's not that you've you know got the feminist message you're a you're a patriarchal male canadian banker you may not care about what american bankers think you have your own self-esteem up here your own sense of banking is in Canadian cultural terms. State regulation is part of how Canadians, we hope, that's me from the south <laughs> looking, admiring to the north. I know things are being dismantled up here. But anyway, we do it this way. This is the way Canadians, you know, act like adult responsible bankers. I don't care what those cowboys in the south think. Or you are a Canadian banker who is constantly listening to what your co-bankers down in New York are saying. Mm. And it makes you very nervous. And you two guys may be friends, but you've got really different audiences as to who makes you either nervous or self-satisfied in your own manliness as a banker. Mm. So when you do your investigation, you always ask people, so who do you... Who do you want to be taken seriously by? Right. Seriousness is always in the eye of the beholder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you always are curious about, well, who's, who are the people that you really want to be seen as serious by? Right. And they can really differ. Mm-hmm. Now, in, in terms of people being taken seriously, one of the things you talked about was uh, report 
that was done in Iceland after the crash mm-hmm. that was a feminist investigation. Now, before we get into the, the content of that, what makes or what made that <sighs> investigation a feminist investigation? And what constitutes a feminist investigation of something like a bank crash? Oh, this is great. Okay. <laughs> in Britain, the United States, and Iceland, mm-hmm. there were government, central government commissioned reports into the causes, which is good public policy. Sure. Before you make the reforms or no reforms, you find out what are the causes. And what feminists do is they always ask to what extent. They don't ask, okay, here's what they don't say. They don't say, did masculinity or some co- distorted notion of that masculinity cause the crash? That's not a good investigatory question. The, the qu- way feminists ask questions is to what extent and in what ways did any distorted notions of masculinity help cause the bubble, mm-hmm. which in turn, when it burst, caused the crash? So you're left open with your investigation to find nothing, to find that, in fact, we've asked all the good gender questions about who's taken seriously by whom, mm-hmm. who competes with whom, who jokes about who not being really up to it, all that, and you found nothing. Mm -hmm. You found that, in fact, it was an equal number of men and women, but also amongst the men, men didn't compete to be the smartest guys. You find nothing. So you come out, you've asked a good feminist question, you say, you know what, in this banking crash, you know, it's really interesting. It was all about class. It Mm -hmm. was actually not about, it was all about profit. It was not anything to do with constructions of gender, either masculinity or femininity. Or you ask those questions and you say, good grief, it just threaded its way through every banking culture we looked at, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes a feminist investigation. So a feminist investigation doesn't start with the answer. It starts with a nuanced question that can turn up findings that you don't expect. Mm -hmm. And so of all the investigatory reports done on all the different banking crashes, including Greece and Portugal, and only the Iceland's official commission said, we want you to investigate whether any kind of notions of masculinity help feed the creation of the bubble. And obviously it did. And... What I found really interesting then is that in Iceland, after the crash, there's an election, and a female prime minister is elected. Right? Yes, right after the crash, right? Right after, and then there was... Her party a, gets the majority, yeah. just like here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was a, a recent election. June 2013. And that party is voted out. Yeah. Now, does that indicate that that report wasn't then taken seriously and finding that masculinity was a factor? Or or was the report taken seriously and then this is just a political outcome that is not related? Or is there some nuance between those two? Okay. I have a, a friend who is the chief opposition party um, finance specialist in the parliament. Okay. Right. And she drove me out to look at a beautiful lighthouse outside of Reykjavik. But she was great. You know, I'm a political scientist, so I love these. She drove me around all the neighborhoods, and because Reykjavik is small, she sort of pointed out, well, this block, really by block, this block kind of votes um, uh, independent party, which is the conservative party. This party kind of, this block votes green. This block <laughs> votes social democrat. Those are three big parties, right? It was really interesting. Yeah. It was really interesting. So what seems to have happened is that the lessons learned in the immediate aftermath of the crash were so many Icelanders were even more seriously hurt than Britons were hurt. Um, there was such a sense of get the independent party out, the pro-bank party. Get them out of here. They caused the crash. But what happened within three years, well, four years, was that voters, and then I'll come to the gender question, that voters, a majority of them, not all, a majority of them, were so angry at the, the very stiff medicine that had to be handed out 
to recoup, and the, the Icelandic economy is now very stable, but it was because the Social Democrats and the Greens, it was a coalition alliance headed by uh, a woman prime minister, um, dished out this hard medicine, but it brought the economy back and it's now in very good shape. But a lot of voters, not all, a lot of voters blamed the coalition headed by a woman um, for the medicine. Right. Now, all of us have very short memories, but here's the question. So now you're, you're the, the feminist investigator mm-hmm. again, and you move right on from curling to banking to the Icelandic elections. Yeah. One of the things that would be interesting to ask is, did, of all the people who voted the independent party back in, and they only got a plurality because it's a multi-party system like here, mm-hmm. Of all the people who voted for an independent MP candidate in there, what we would here would call a riding, yep. what percentage were men and what percentage were women? Mm. And I believe that there it was a gender gap. Okay. Now, meaning that more men than women voted for the independent party MP candidate in their district. Mm. But you'd have to ask. Right. But that depends on having gender exit polls that disaggregates by gender people coming out because you can't do it by the voting booth, you know. Sure. Um, so you've got to have gender disaggregated exit polling to be able to do your investigation. Or you can go around and ask people and see if they will actually honestly tell you who they voted for. But if there is such a gap, and I, I, I'm... Sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. But, Not all the time. Well, in general, I've, I've always heard that women tend to be a little more left of center than men do. Since or is that just too much of a generalization? You've you got to pick your country. Yeah. Um, and it, where people have charted the gender gap in particular countries, and I think mm-hmm. it's true here, you could ask your Canadian electoral specialist, feminist specialist especially. I believe it's really since the mid-'80s. Okay. It's not the 30s. It's not the 50s, it's the mid-80s, and it's particularly as the parties began to really differ, the Canadian, the American, the British parties, those are the three to watch, Mm -hmm. as the parties have really begun to differ on their attitudes to the social safety net. Mm -hmm. And if they've also taken up issues of reproductive rights or of taking seriously domestic violence or all kinds of violence against women, if Mm -hmm. that's also part of it, that is what has widened the gap Mm -hmm. between women voting and men voting. And a widened gap means a 10%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's decisive in an election, about a 10% gender gap. Okay. But since the 80s. So it's very particular historically. Okay. But So then back to that uh, example in Iceland then. Mm. With men then voting the independent party, more men, more men, men voting. Yeah, uh, would there be a gender gap with more men voting for the independent party? Does that speak to then those men who are voting re- or not taking seriously the implementation of this feminist report by a female prime minister, and then get that gets back to this culture of masculinity within the industry, and maybe these men feel as though that the the system has been emasculated and therefore it's not as effective or right well you know what there's your question (laughs) i know i mean really which is you know what you just crafted a great question right and this is not to pass it off because it says okay we really don't know what happened in iceland Mm -hmm. we've got a hunch Mm -hmm. hunches are always good and then we've got to figure out how to go and ask questions in a way that people will be honest so you right. got to ask the question in a way that doesn't say, hey, Johansson, yeah. you know, were you dumb enough to forget what just yeah. happened and you voted the banking, pro-banking party back in? No, no. So, but you're, the way you pose the question is exactly the question you want to try and answer. Then you go and craft actual questions voter by voter, mm-hmm. by gender, age, income, and the income gaps are not very wide in Iceland – region of the country, especially rural, urban in Iceland, mm. right? Because it seems as though it was rural voters who especially voted the, uh, the, in the, the more conservative party back in. And then you, 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 and then you tell us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Find out, right? right? But that's yeah. why this conference here, with all these hundreds of investigators, really, mm-hmm. um, it's why it's so exciting. Because right. you have to figure out, 
okay, what question do you really want answered, and how are you going to go about answering it? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's sort of the core of what it is, it's, right? It's why, you know, sometimes we're called scholars, sometimes we're called academics, sometimes we're called intellectuals, you know. Most of us are te- just teachers, yeah. but we're teachers and investigators, mm-hmm. and all of us are constantly reworking our question to think, oh, I didn't quite get the question right, right? Yeah. I, or I, there are new sources I never knew. You know, yeah. I, all the, the Soviet-era archives are coming out, so there's all kinds of new gender histories of the Soviet era that we can now do that we never could do before. Right. So it it's an ongoing investigatory collective process. Mm-hmm. It's very exciting. Mm-hmm. Well, I know for me too, one thing that I was sitting there yesterday and one of my favorite things that I found in the archives was uh, studying oh. the CBC and their first program conference that they did. Oh, wow. It was in Toronto down on Hayter Street here and there was no women in the program department early on Wow! at this first one. Later on, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Long was hired to do women's programming. <laughs> Classic. Which was, yeah, which was defined as like cooking and cleaning shows. And wow. Because uh, they got all their soap operas, which they defined as women's program from the United States early on. Whoa. But, this is great. You're going to yeah. put this into your own study? Well, this is, this is what... This, you got to. Well, it's, it's in, but it's not done in sort of notions of masculinity right. and femininity. And one of the things that I found, and it's in, the, it's in my dissertation, at their first programming conference... One of the guys in his, his reminiscence in an right. interview, he said that the real work, yeah, we had our sessions. Real, real. Yeah, the real work happened once the conference was over and we were in the bar. <sighs> and that's when we really set the schedule. We were having some drinks, a couple mattresses got thrown out windows, and that's when it really happened. And it never, it don't, I, in my thesis, I talk about, yes, it's a male dominated thing and it's a, it's a institution. And it's masculinized. That, but that's what hit me yesterday. Is that it's a masculinized environment? I, like I, I, like who goes to the bar and yeah. who goes to that bar and yeah. stays after it gets rowdy? Yeah, and that's and, and to me that's what really struck me is yes, I, I talk about how it's a male institution, um, but I don't get into yeah a you masculinized just, culture of that's it. That's right, and that strikes me as like that's that's an article that I think I have to write. You now. do, you are going to write <laughs> yeah. it, yeah. And particularly, you could even write an article just about that conference. Right. And the thing is, what. All of us have learned as feminists, and we learned it by hanging out with ethnographers especially. Uh-huh. That's why Karen Ho yesterday was great. Yeah. Um, and that is you never study the factory floor or the office floor or the CBC office. You never study them by staying in the office. Right. What happens on the commuter train mm-hmm. where a lot of conversations go on, and also what do they read on the commuter train, mm. right? Yeah. Do they read the Financial Times or they read, right? And then what, who goes with whom out to lunch? Who goes with whom to the pub after work or after the conference? Mm -hmm. It's the hanging out time, right? Which for a lot of industries now at the elite level also includes the golf course. Sure. I know women who are told when they are getting up in the higher ranks of big industries, that they have to learn how to play golf. Oh, yeah. And I've been told that by women getting in the higher ranks of militaries. Really? You want to be put up for general or Mm -hmm. for admiral. You have to learn how to play golf. And that's as if they know what ethnographers have been telling us, which is the culture of a place is not created just, well, certainly not created just where the minutes are taken. Mm-hmm. They are taken at the coffee breaks, at the lunch breaks, and at the pub, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And also, who has who over to dinner, and who goes into the next room while the women clean up and have a good chat in the kitchen, right? Right. right? Yeah, it's... And you're going to send me this article, right? When, when yeah, you write when, it. When I write it, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, this is good. Because it's not just a male institution. Mm -hmm. It's a masculinized institution, which could mean that women coming in, unless they're ghettoized over into what's called the women's pages or, Mm -hmm. you know, women's program, that those women are also pushed to take on masculinized notion. Mm -hmm. I, there's a wonderful documentary called No Job for a Woman, and it compares, it's 
three of the first women to fight and win to get to be war correspondents for American newspapers during World War II. Okay. And, a, and all three of them devised different individual strategies for breaking through or smuggling their way into the masculinized world of the war correspondent. Mm. So they, no job for a woman. It's so a they great sort of film. adhere to these masculinized... But they had different strategies right. for whether they'd play up their femininity. Mm. There was one woman... Oh, I'm got, now I'm, I feel bad. I'm a little talking head on it, but it's not my, my thing. But I learned so much by being on it. But, but one woman... Um, trained herself to be able to drink the other the guys under the table okay right and so she thought i am not going to lose a story by not being able to go out and drink with the guys Mm -hmm. right whereas another woman no no pubs for her she had a different strategy so it was really interesting three different pioneers Mm -hmm. breaking into a masculinized world of war correspondence so you have both journalism which is masculinized Uh overseas journalism which is masculinized and war journalism you take the three together and it's really a boys club Uh, but they broke into it but they all did used a different gender strategy to break in Hmm. really interesting Hmm. film no job for a woman okay and so speaking then of breaking in you also talked yesterday about in the american context during the creation of the stimulus package which was uh, after the election in november of 2008 but before this is obama yeah, right so before he takes office right. but after he's been elected so in the interim there as he's crafting the legislation there are two female economists who get uh invited no, or they, no. Uh, they, they push forced, their way. They forced their way in. <laughs> and never invited. Yeah, so into the discussions yeah. and, and fundamentally changes how that legislation is crafted. Right. So are in that example, they're also masculinizing or finding a way into this masculine culture? Finding or, or a way th- in, which is really different. So they okay. aren't doing the equivalent of trying to drink the guys under the table, <laughs> Right. right? One, and actually it's a whole group of them, but they were maybe 12 of them. And they, okay. what was great is they were a combination of feminist economists mm-hmm. who could really work the numbers but also to, knew how to watch job employment data, which is really a skill. And the other was, and how you create jobs, which kinds of, which kinds of expenditures create the most jobs. That takes a feminist economist to ask that gender question. And the other were feminist historians. Mm -hmm. So the two of the most prominent, they definitely weren't the only ones, was Heidi Hartman, who is based in D.C., and she's a feminist economist, watches job creation, what kind of public expenditure creates the most jobs for women and for men. Mm -hmm. And the other is Linda Gordon, who's a very famous, she's very famous amongst all the people at the Berks here. And she is a... Um, a con- uh, she is a historian of women's work, amongst other things, and women's social conditions. And so they got together, and what they, and this whole group of them, they're not the only ones, this group of a dozen of them, and they said, oh, my God, Obama, which almost all of them voted for, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. His team is about to make a horrible gender mistake. They are about to think that they can just get out of this terrible recession, by reproducing the Franklin Roosevelt New Deal stimulus package of the 1930s. So Linda and her team of, of, a, of historians went back and found out, because they know how to do this, so who got jobs during the New Deal? Mm-hmm. Men or women, by race as well as by gender, right? And what they found was that a much greater percentage of men got jobs from the famous New Deal than women. In Mm -hmm. fact, a lot of women who were married lost their jobs because employers said, you've got a husband taking care of you. So it was a double whammy. Mm -hmm. Linda said, but look at the economy of the United States in the 1930s. It was a very particular economy. Yes, there were a lot of women, especially women of color, who depended on having paid work, but nowhere near as high a percentage as now. Now almost 50% of all American adult women have waged work. 
It was a much smaller percentage sure. in 1929, 30. Heidi Hartman came along and said, look at what kinds of jobs now, if the federal government stimulates them, who will the jobs go to? Because the Obama team, not just Obama, the Obama team, a lot of economists who wouldn't know gender if they fell over it, right? Even though they got elected by the women's vote, because it was a gender gap that elected Obama, Mm -hmm. um, women of all races, by the way. Um, And Heidi said, yeah, but look at who's in the conventional stimulus package industries, construction and um, road building, right? It's men. Right. Now, it's more diverse men than it was. A lot of Latino men are in construction. But if you just stick to the New Deal FDR classic stimulus, Mm -hmm. what's going to happen to all the women who've just lost their jobs in the Great Recession? So they kind of pushed the doors open, and they had cultivated contacts in the mid-level of Obama's team. Mm. And they reminded them of how they got elected. (laughs) And they reminded them, you don't want a failed stimulus, do you? Right? Well, no. Yes, right? And so they said, no, no, we're for social justice and economic justice. And, you know, and that's why jobs in education and jobs in health were added to the Obama stimulus package, and it's no longer roads and bridges, Mm -hmm. right? Roads, bridges, buildings. And the fact that it's roads, bridges, buildings, education, and health care as the Obama stimulus package, had a lot to do with the feminist economists and the feminist historians who sort of opened their eyes with data, mm-hmm. with information, and really persuaded them. Is part of the reluctance to go with that sort of thing maybe the fact that it's harder to quantify progress in something like education and healthcare. If you build a building, you built a building. If you build a road, the road is there. Right. It's harder to sort of prove improvements in education or healthcare. Is maybe that part of it? And maybe the sort of thing that, again, this masculinized version of, you know, profits is what right. determines success. And so in this context of a stimulus package, well, I mean, you need a tangible result, something that I can point to and say, we did this. And every, no one can debate yeah. it, right? Is that maybe part of it? Yes. And, in fact, I think one of the, the great contributions that feminists of all kinds of investigatory – so I really am very interested in media investigators as well mm-hmm. as scholarly investigators. One of the, our great – collectively, one of the great contributions has been as to how you do reliable research on things that people think you can't research. Right. Right? Yeah. So people think – they know how to count construction jobs. They think they don't know how to count health care jobs. Right. But we've all, that's not me particularly, we all have come along and said, of course you can count health care jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't yeah. think the only kind of jobs you can count are building the skyscrapers in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Right? You can also count all the jobs created at sick kids. Sure. Right? And so to change the notion comes back to seriously, to change the notion of what is reliable data, uh-huh. what's reliable documentation, what's reliable evidence. That's one of the main things that all the people here at the Berks are doing. But I, I'm saying, like, if I'm, an, if I'm Obama yeah. and I'm thinking about my re-election, yeah. it's hard to put into a political ad, say, oh, health care improved 2% because we have all these jobs, as opposed to we built 10 buildings. Right, it's it's an easier sort of bullet point to put in my campaign, and you know, with healthcare, what am I going to say? Like two percent people less died, like because like, you, yeah. you just don't know. And like it, it seems to me like just simplistically, it's easier to say, well, we'll focus on these sorts of projects that have a physical legacy, as opposed to ones that have a more amorphous, yeah, right, and and. And again, and to me, that would speak to a masculine thing where profit is king. Right. To get, take it back to As the banking. It, because I think the word you used was simplistically, and that's exactly right, yes. right? Yeah. As versus simple, right? Yeah. Simplistically says um, uh, distortedly simple, right? Mm-hmm. So what one always has to do with public policy is provide evidence that is communicatable, right? Mm-hmm. So that any of us can say, look, here is a measure to show how health care has improved, mm-hmm. right? 
it is measurable. Mm-hmm. Now, you've got to find indicators that are not simplistic, right? Sure. But they have to be understandable to people. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that's very interesting about the gender gap in voting is, oddly enough, one of the masculinized myths is that men being men, boys being boys, are better than in math, right? right. <laughs> but in fact, women voters somehow are more sophisticated in calculating costs and benefits mm. when they vote than are a lot, not all, but a lot of men. It's a very interesting thing. When women vote, and especially women who are not married, are either widowed or divorced or never married, they especially are so fine-tuned in their ability to analyze the weak and strong economies, and that really affects their their voting. So mm-hmm. it is really interesting. So what kind of math is simplistic, and what mm-hmm. kind of math, if you will, accounting, really, right. is more sophisticated? Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's a similar debate actually goes on in baseball. Oh, yeah. And Bob Ryan, of, who famous uh, reporter for the Boston Globe, right? he wrote a piece this Sunday about advanced analytics in baseball and basically said, you know what, maybe they are more effective at actually saying what happened in the game, but nobody, you can't, the regular person can't understand them. So really, what's the point? And he went a little deeper than that, but... I mean, if we have all these advanced things, but nobody understands them, it's almost like... If it's a tree, like a derivative in banking. Yeah. You know? the, yeah, it's like if it's sort of like if a tree falls in the yeah. forest, does it make a sound if no one can hear? Like, it's the same idea of, like, if we have these things, but if no one can Well, one of the them. things, because I'm from Boston, and, of yeah. course, we've just... The, we, the Sox, have just lost seven in a row. Three in a row to the Blue Jays. <laughs> yeah, three in a row to the, the Blue Jays. The first place Blue Jays. I, I have a feeling by the time we post this, they probably won't be the first place Blue <laughs> That's Jays. That's all right. But, you know, yeah, right, right now. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. No, but I, I'm a diehard Sox fan. But yeah. on the other hand, one of the things that you hear in Sox, Red Sox um, commentary all the time is, and I think it really matters, is what is the locker room culture? Yeah. Right, And for those of you who are listening that care about the Red Sox at all, we care about David Ortiz and Dustin Pedroia. Pedroia is, you know, not much taller than I am. Yeah, he really is tall. Everyone's taller than I am. But anyway, he's a lot much taller. And David Ortiz is a great big guy. And they're very different kinds of players. But what everyone says is the Sox strength is their clubhouse culture. Right. That is, don't let it get you down. Support everybody, bring the new young guys along, teach them how to be a good Red Sox. Mm-hmm. Well, so where's the numbers, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, how do you quantify a good locker room culture? Mm-hmm. But every manager will tell you, oh, my God, the, the locker room culture is just toxic. Right. You know, we can't do anything in there. Right. Or they'll say, as they do about the Red Sox, Look, there's a really good. We can get through this because we've got a really good locker room culture where these guys are going to support each other. They're not going to let anyone really go down into the doldrums. Mm-hmm. We'll get through it. And I think you're right. I mean, I I understand that we now watch on base. Is that the right term? On base percentage, percentage right? Yeah. Which means you count walks. Yep. People who can get a good walk mm-hmm. are really valuable to the team because maybe they can steal or you know yeah. whatever. But so I understand why you count that, and you change. Used to never count who got on base mm-hmm. by walk, as if that didn't matter. Well, we now know where it matters, but it's not the only thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's interesting to bring up the example of the Red Sox. Yeah. I guess three years ago was the chicken and beer crowd. Yes, and which was the September, toxic lock. Yeah. yeah, the toxic clock lock yeah. room culture. And then Bobby Valentine the next year, and that sort of falls apart. And then ne- last year they win the World Series with. Obviously, some different players, but for the most part, it's the same team. And and a lot of veterans that everybody was willing to trade. Yeah. You know? And and so, again, yeah, it comes down to, like, there's certain things that you can't necessarily see. It's called see. chemistry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But there can, be a, there can be a toxic chemistry, mm-hmm. and that's that the smartest guys in the room, banking culture that created. Right. Think of Think of the, the beer and chicken crowd. Yeah. As the equivalent, because they all thought they were having a good time, you know, yeah. as the bubble culture in mm. the big Wall Street banks. Right. All right. Now, I guess the last question that I'll ask is: <laughs> We could go on about. We you could. Know. I could do. I could do this all day. I really could. <laughs> this is fun. Uh, but 
<laughs> eventually we, we can't sit in here yeah. all day. So um, the last question I'll ask is this, you, you talk about having a feminist approach. Right. And I know what the answer is. I'm going to ask this yeah, question. Sure. Anyway, no, though. no, good. Um, Cause obviously the term feminist again, and I'll, I'll say this from a male point sure. of view seems exclusionary to us. Uh, but so if I'm a I'm, I'm a man, I want to undertake a feminist approach to something. How can I do that so that I'm included and not looked upon by female feminists right. as trying to even appropriate something? Right. That's really good. And of course, there are male feminist historians here at this sure, conference. Of course, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two things. For, first, is be curious about not only your own masculinity, but how how are boys and men pressured to be a certain kind of man and not another kind of man, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So be curious about the constructions, plural, of masculinities, plural, yeah. and how different boys and men react to it. I mean, you and I both know, and you're probably one of them, that when a really sexist joke is told, you don't laugh. Right. right now, you might be under a lot of social pressure to laugh, especially in a locker room. Absolutely, yeah. because it's about solidarity, and if yeah. you don't laugh, like, aren't you part of the team? Right. right. So the social, but that's really interesting for a feminist. That is really interesting, and right. since you're going to be in the locker room and I'm not, yeah. you have to report on it. Right. right? Yeah. As well as how hard it is to not laugh when you want to be seen as part of the team. Right. right? But that's all investigation. The other thing, so one is be curious about the constructions, plural, of masculinities and different boys and men's attempts to negotiate it, right? Mm -hmm. The second thing is take women seriously, all kinds of women, all kinds of girls, and that means not treating all women as heroes, all women as angels, all women as admirable. Feminists don't aren't curious about women because they think every woman is Florence Nightingale, who, by the way, is really interesting, <laughs> right? Created modern hospital yeah. administration. Um, not because you think that all women, even Mar uh, Florence Nightingale, are admirable because you think all women are interesting. And interesting means if you pay attention to them, you'll be smarter in your explanations of how the world works. Mm. So those are the two things. Be curious about masculinities, mm -hmm. how they get navigated, how they get formed, how they get reformed, and be really interested, take seriously, how girls and women work their ways in the world. Is that – I said that was the last question. I'm going to follow yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that simply a matter of agency then and providing agency to everyone? And, and, and But then that gets to a certain – area of, and this was something that was in a panel this morning, sure. talking about this notion of the individualistic identity, yeah. and, and but there's flaws with that as well. So No, it's not we, about individualism, although you can be very curious about individualism. Right. right? But if I'm to take everybody seriously, yes, do but, I not have to take them in, seriously as individuals? Yeah, but, but not because you're only interested in them as individuals. How do they relate? Do they refuse to organize? Okay. There are a lot of women who become, are not just individuals, mm -hmm. we all are individuals, sure. but who are individualistic. Uh -huh. So, for instance, in my university, this is 30 years ago, but it could still be true in a lot of offices, we tried to get women staff people to organize, this is early, early days, organize against sexual harassment. And a number of women who I knew were objects of it but they said their professional skill as a secretary meant that by themselves they could handle it. Mm. So what you do is you put your, your desk so, and your chair against the wall so no male professor can come and, quote, lean over you to give you a memo to type. Right. And so they said, I don't need to organize. I'm perfectly capable as a professional secretary to handle this by myself. Now, I was really interested in that. Sure. Because they were individualistic mm -hmm. in their individual responses. Right. So it didn't mean I was really unhappy and hoping they would kind of gain more solidarity with other women who were being harassed, but I was still interested. Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. to be interested in individuals 
is to be interested in who is individualistic, mm -hmm. men and women, and who really sees, no, I've got to, I've got to join with others. That's right. the only way we're going to change anything around this place. Mm -hmm. And we take both of those things seriously. Absolutely. Right. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> this, this has been, been, fun been for me. so much fun. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. It, this this has been this has been great. This conference it's it's Friday afternoon right now. There's still two days to go. My mind has been blown <laughs> like eight times <laughs> so far. It's been so much fun. Uh, so Cynthia Enlow, thank you so much for doing this. I, I appreciate it. And we would encourage everybody. The book again, the new book is seriously exclamation point uh, investigating crashes and crises as if women mattered. Again, Cynthia Enlow, Clark University. Thank you so much for doing this. Go socks, go curling. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Anybody has any questions, comments for the podcast, it's historyslam at gmail.com. Twitter is at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.